I love it. I love it. Wow. <laughs> I love it. Look at this. This is, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Hey, I'm not surprised. <laughs> hey, my homies, my homies. What's popping, man? UFC 267. I don't know how to put this. It's kind of a big deal. It's a big deal, man. As always, guys, make sure you... Hamzat smashed the like button. It's never been more necessary because Hamzat is fighting on this card. You know, maybe a little bit of an insight into the Hamzat breakdown already. But yeah, man, let's jump straight into it. Let's break him down. Tagir Ulanbekov taking on Alan Nascimento. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but Alan Nascimento seems to be a jiu-jitsu guy. 18 pro wins and 14 of them are by submission. Not the most active. You know, he had that contender series fight against Julian Paver back in 2018. Since then, he's had one fight. Looking at Tagir Ulanbekov's UFC debut against Bruno Silva. Bruno Silva did a nice job landing the calf kick over and over, but apart from the calf kick and maybe competing with the wrestling a little better than I expected, apart from that, to get Ulan Bekov, you know, he looked pretty good. He did slow down a little bit as the fight went, uh, but he showed us what he's about, you know, uh, a composed Russian with that combat sambo background. So you've got wrestling versus jujitsu. You know, UFC 267 kind of looks like it could be a Russian invasion. So I'm going to start the card with that prediction. I'll start with Russia. If Nascimento cannot submit to Gear Ulan Bekov, he's probably going to lose a decision based on top control. You know, takedowns. So that's going to be my first prediction. I'll take to Gear Ulan Bekov maybe a decision yeah my numbers on this one i would put to get ulan bekov at least a minus 200 don't really like the inactivity of nascimento and the actual numbers we've got to get ulan bekov minus 300 so yeah the bookies are like hey if you're trying to get paid on the russian we're gonna make you pay for that minus 300 if you want to lay any money it's a veteran move from the bookie you know overpricing the favorite underpricing the dog yeah i'll stick with uh the russian though all right we've got demir ismagulov taking on magomed mustafaev man this is a fire matchup already you know both of these guys are assassins really magomed is a grappler but if you look at his striking filthy really nasty filthy what he done to fiziv man just so shocking I took Magomed in that fight, but never did I expect that type of finish. But it just goes to show, you know, how well-rounded Magomed is. But the opponent on the flip side, Demir Ismagulov, also super well-rounded. You know, boxing, Muay Thai, wrestling. Demir Ismagulov pretty much has it all, in my opinion. The only thing that Demir Ismagulov hasn't shown to have at this point is killer instinct. You know, he's 4-0 in the UFC, but all of these wins are decisions. So despite being well-rounded, despite having that skill set, he's not putting away the opponent. Without a doubt, this is a big step up in competition for Demir Ismagulov. You know, he fought Thiago Moises, Joel Alvarez, Alex Georges, and uh, Rafael Alves. Magomed Mustafayev is a more respectable name than all of the guys Demir has fought at this point. Man, this one's just a fire matchup. You look at Magomed go to war with Brad Riddell. You know, who's taking shots from Brad Riddell? Magomed did. You know, he took some clean shots. Despite looking at what Magomed can do on the feet, it's probably going to be wise to take down Demir Ismagulov. If he takes him down... Maybe he can beat him. But if this one stays striking, I'm going to side with Demir Ismagulov. You know, super composed. Like I said, hasn't got the killer instinct. But when you look at the composure, the cleanness of his striking, you know, Demir Ismagulov, he's a top prospect. So yeah, man, really decent matchup. I'm going to side with Demir Ismagulov. I think if he can fight his fight on the feet, probably going to pick apart Magomed Mustafaev. 
My numbers on this one, guys, I'm going to be a little bit harsh on Magomed Mustafaev purely because I rate Demir that highly. I'm going to put Demir minus, at least a minus 300. And we've got Demir Ismagulov minus 250, minus 275. So yeah, even the bookies are like, yo, this guy's good. He's good, man. Absolutely love this matchup. I think it's a nice step up in competition for Demir Ismagulov. But I'm going to say he passes the test and beats the Russian, Mustafaev. All right, we've got Yazong Hu or Hu Yazong taking on Andre Petrosky. So Petrosky is a wrestler from the Ultimate Fighter. Didn't do too well on the Ultimate Fighter, but had a UFC debut after that. And uh, yeah, pretty much obliterated Michael Gilmore. Hu Yazong is coming down from heavyweight or light heavyweight, now fighting at middleweight. The UFC were like adamant to do Hu Yazong versus Amadovsky. They had that fight back in July. It didn't happen. They tried to put it together on UFC 267, but Amadovsky is out. So Petrovsky stepping in. So a new opponent for Hu Yazong and probably a different type of fight too. You know, Amadovsky was probably going to try to trade with Hu Yazong. Andre Petrovsky is probably going to look to take down the opponent, considering he's a wrestler. And you look at the debut with the ground and pound, he's probably going to try to do that again. Hu Yazong is arguably the most inactive fighter in the UFC. Had a fight at heavyweight in 2017. Then he had a fight at light heavyweight in 2018. And now he's having a fight at middleweight in 2021. He lost at heavyweight. He lost at light heavyweight. I'm going to say that Hu Yazong loses at middleweight because Andre Petrosky is just too good with the takedown. Now we have seen Petrosky kind of fade a little bit. You know, if he gets wrestling, he can slow down after round one. So if the Muay Thai fighter in Hu Yazong can... You know, take advantage of that, look to strike with Petrosky when he slows down, then maybe there's an avenue for Hu Yazong to win. But what I'm seeing, I'm seeing Petrosky getting the takedown and ultimately the ground and pound too. So that's going to be my prediction in a little bit of a weird matchup on a fire card. I'm going to side with the wrestler, Andre Petrosky. Yeah, my numbers on this one, you know, how much are we going to fade Hu Yazong? I'll put Petrosky around minus two. And we have no numbers on this one. There's no numbers whatsoever. So it's going to be interesting to see what they open with. You know, it's pretty black and white. If Petrosky can take down the opponent, it's probably going to be a great fight for him. If he's left to strike on the feet, then it, it might get, you know, it might get interesting. But I'll say the wrestler wrestles. All right, we're back to a fire matchup in my opinion. We've got Makwan Amiakani taking on Lerone Murphy. Fire matchup, man. You know, Makwan Amiakani has had a bunch of UFC fights at this point. We know what Makwan is all about. Submission wrestling. He wants to wrestle you into a submission. You know, when you think of the Anaconda choke, who do you think of? You think of Makwan Amiakani. He's brilliant at the Anaconda choke. Now there has been times with Makwan, man, you can see where it doesn't work out for him. Against Shane Burgos. You know, he wrestled well in round one, but the size of Shane Burgos, he couldn't continue to wrestle. And Shane Burgos really took over with the striking too. You know, when, when the fight wasn't in that grappling exchange, Shane Burgos was punishing Makwan Amiakani. Edson Barboza basically punished Makwan too when the fight wasn't in that wrestling exchange. His gas tank isn't the best. Round one seems to be the most dangerous round from Amiakani. Now, Lerone Murphy, an undefeated mixed martial artist, primarily a boxer. You know, you look at his fight against Ricardo Ramos. Ricardo Ramos is a tricky striker. You know, he tried to hypnotize Lerone Murphy with those kicks. Straight. But it didn't work for Ricardo Ramos. You know, that fight ended with some ground and pound too. You know, Lerone Murphy showing that he's well-rounded. Now, despite Lerone Murphy finishing that fight with ground and pound, despite him having that 
pretty okay UFC debut against Zubaira, another decent grappler. Despite these performances, you still probably don't want to grapple with Makwan Amiakani. Or at least in the first round. I think after round one, you know, Makwan slows down. You can probably grapple after round one. You know, in round one, Makwan Amiakani is going to try to grapple Lerone Murphy. He's going to try to take him to the mat. And that Anaconda choke, you know, he is a specialist with the Anaconda. My prediction, guys, I'm going to side with Lerone Murphy. If he doesn't get submitted in round one, he's probably going to take over with the boxing in round two. You know, start to piece up Mac 1. It's a really good fight, though. You know, Lerone Murphy undefeated as a mixed martial artist, and he probably stays undefeated if that Anaconda choke doesn't happen. Unless Mac 1 has really improved his cardio, which I don't see happening to be honest not at 32 nearly 33 years old i'm gonna give makwan amiakani one round to get the submission if he doesn't lerone murphy all day my numbers on this one because it's a round one or bust situation for makwan in my opinion i'm gonna put lerone murphy at least a minus 250 and the actual numbers we've got lerone murphy minus 300 minus 350 so the bookies again man they're like, yo, if you're trying to make money in this spot right here on Lerone Murphy, best believe you're going to pay some tax. You know, that's what the bookies try to do, man. They want to make those strong positions scary to play. But yeah, it's a sign that Lerone Murphy's probably going to win if he doesn't get submitted in round one. All right, guys, we've got Michael Oleksayshuk taking on Shamil Gamzatov. Man, Quite a difficult prediction to make. All right, so I remember betting on Shamil Gamzatov in his UFC debut against Clinton Abreu. I remember betting him and I was thinking this might not have been a great bet. So I went back to watch his UFC debut just to see if I had the same feelings. And to be honest, man, I did. You know, it was a close fight and there wasn't really anything that Shamil Gamzatov done that made me think, do you know what? I can't wait to bet on you again. It was a bit of a lacklustre fight. But what you can see from Shamil Gamzatov, you know, the body kicks, the low kicks, he used a lot of that. He is a Russian, so he can grapple. So low kicks, body kicks, and potential grappling is what Shamil Gamzatov might do in this matchup. Now, Michael Oleksayshuk isn't the biggest 205er, but he's got a high output, you know, primarily a boxer, loves to rip to the body. To be completely honest, guys, I can make good points on Oleksayshuk. I can make good points on Gamzatov. The good points for Oleksayshuk would be he's a better boxer, higher output, fought better competition. The good points on Gamzatov would be he's a bigger man, maybe more powerful, maybe could outgrapple Oleksayshuk. You know, this one, in my opinion, I'm not confident either side. You know, yesterday I was thinking Oleksayshuk is the pick. Today I'm thinking Gamzatov may be the pick. If Michael Oleksayshuk does win this one, it's probably going to be output and that he isn't out grappled. But, you know, if Gamzatov wins, probably because he decided to, to out wrestle the opponent, which would be a smart game plan. I'm going to side with the Russian, but like I said, guys, it's really a 50-50 matchup. My numbers, I would put Gamzatov minus 130, Oleksayshuk plus 100. And the actual numbers, we've got Gamzatov minus 170, minus 160. You know, so it's nothing like Lerone Murphy or Demir Ismagulov. The bookies ain't really saying to you, you have to pay tax. To play this one which is kind of a sign that whoever shows up in this one that's going to be the winner i'm going to say it's russia but it's difficult to be confident elizu zaleski taking on benoit saint denis god of war so we've got a newcomer here with benoit i looked into some tape and to be honest man seems like a good signing one thing i did notice is he doesn't look like the biggest welterweight Looks more like a lightweight, in all honesty. But you look at some of his wins, man. You know, he's getting the submission wins. The grappling looks good. The striking, it looks okay. 
you know, seems like a, a decent signing. But the opponent, Elizu Zaleski, you know, to get this man in his UFC debut, it's no walk in the park. Luigi Vendramini was 8-0 and he got a UFC debut against Zaleski and it was over in the first round. Benoit Saint-Denis, also 8-0. You know, are we going to see a round one stoppage for Zaleski? You look at what Zaleski done to Sean Strickland. You know, that's what Zaleski's all about, man. It's the flying knees, the, the high kicks, the spinning attacks. And if none of that works, you know, he can take you to the mat and look to use his jiu-jitsu. I do want to mention that Zaleski is turning 35 years old soon. And the newcomer is only 25 years old. You know what, guys? I'm going to take a shot. I'm going to take a shot on the newcomer, Benoit Saint-Denis. If he can survive round one the way Luigi Vandramini couldn't, then maybe he can, you know, start to make Zaleski show his age. And by that, I mean, you know, just whatever's happening, just be in the fight, compete in what's happening. If you're grappling against the fence, grapple hard, grapple heavy. You know, if you're striking, make Zaleski use those big explosive movements. If we go to the mat and Zaleski has the top control, Make Zaleski work to keep it. Look to use some sweeps. I think if the newcomer, God of War, wants to win this one, he has to just compete. Be in the fight and compete. Zaleski is no walk in the park, like I mentioned, but I'm going to take a shot. I'm going to take a shot on the newcomer. My numbers, man, I do expect Zaleski to be a favourite because, you know, why wouldn't he be a favourite? We don't have any numbers on this matchup. But like I said, the favourite is probably going to be Zaleski. And if Benoit is an underdog, you know, might take that shot. Alright guys, moving into Albert Durayev taking on Roman Kopolov. Now for anyone who missed the Contender Series fight for Durayev, this guy's basically a smasher. You know, he's the same thing as Habib, Hamzat. Take down the opponent... Ground and pound, if they give up the submission, take the sub. If they don't give up the submission, just keep ground and pounding away until they quit. That's what Albert Durayev is looking to do. Now, Roman Kopolov has only had one UFC fight, and it came two years ago. And he got submitted by Carl Robeson. You know, if you're getting submitted by Carl Robeson... You know, rightfully so, take a couple years off because that's that's no bueno. Whether you take two years off or not, you know, getting submitted by Carl Robeson tells me everything I need to know. I'm going to take Albert Durayev to completely obliterate Roman Kopolov. Now, if Roman Kopolov does somehow win this one, it's probably because he was able to strike and uh, find a knockout punch. But if that doesn't happen, you know it's Durayev with the ground and pound, that Hamzat-like performance. So that's what I'm going to go with here. I'm going to take the machete. My numbers, I'd have to put Durayev at least to minus 200, maybe up to minus 250. And the bookies say Durayev minus 275, touching minus 3 on some books. Yeah, you can see, you can see what's going to happen with this matchup. You know, Roman Kopolov. Taken down and submitted by who? A kickboxer in Carl Robeson. A guy who got ankle picked a, a couple months ago, a few months ago by Brendan Allen. Yeah, I'm going to take the machete. Alright, moving into Zubaira Takugov taking on Ricardo Ramos. Low-key a decent matchup. You know, we spoke a little bit about Zuba and Ricardo earlier on with the Lerone Murphy breakdown. Zuba is a Russian grappler. You know, he loves to grapple. This guy kind of likes to strike too. You know, if you go back and watch his performances, you know, he's a Russian that doesn't mind doing both. He'll use his hands. He'll like to box. But if he can level change, take you to the mat, use that part of his game. You know, he's going to do that. Ricardo Ramos, like I mentioned earlier, you know, this guy's a bit of a tricky striker. You know, this one really gives me the vibes of a pick'em. If Zubaira is able to get those takedowns, 
and avoid the jujitsu of Ricardo Ramos because Ramos also has some good jujitsu. You know, if he can avoid those submission attempts and just rain down with some ground and pound, hold on to that top control, then he could beat Ricardo Ramos. Ricardo Ramos, arguably a better striker, but I wouldn't say he's got a better chin. You know, if Zubaira took Ricardo's best shot, I reckon he can take it. But if Zubaira lands his cleanest punch on Ricardo, you know, I'm not too sure Ricardo's going to take that. Zubaira's had some good fights against Kevin Aguilar, who he knocked out. Against Hakeem Dawadu, you know, outclassed a little bit by the Muay Thai striker. Also, if you remember towards the end of that fight, Zubaira was kind of backpedaling. You know, didn't really want to throw down with Hakeem. I can't see Zubaira backpedaling against Ricardo Ramos. Maybe for a little bit in round one, when Ricardo's getting tricky with the kicks. But after round one, it could be the case of Zubaira mixing it up with takedowns. You know, having some, uh, some success with his boxing. It's a good matchup, guys, but I'm going to stick with Russia. I think it might be a Russian invasion on this one. So yeah, my prediction is going to be Zubaira. Maybe a decision. My numbers, I'll keep them close though. I'll put Zubaira minus 150. And the bookies say minus 160 up to minus 170. So yeah, man, I think it's in the ballpark. It's a winnable fight for both guys. But I'm slightly leaning towards Russia. All right, my homies, we're going to spark up for this one. And I'll tell you why. We did it last week. We're going to do it again. All right, the first reason, Amanda Rebas kind of got the same vibe as uh, Tabitha Ricci, you know? You know, she's got some cheeks back there, man, you know? And the second reason, Amanda Rebas is a jiu-jitsu player, and jiu-jitsu players love to smoke weed. Verna Jandaroba, also a jiu-jitsu player. Now, guys, if we're going to make a pick on this fight, like, based on who's got the better cheeks, yeah? It's Amanda Rebas all day. But someone left a comment last week, or the week before, and they basically said, what I've been doing with female MMA recently, I ask myself who's better looking, and then I pick the other fighter. Verna Jandaroba, also a black belt, so she's up there with her jiu-jitsu. You know, who's the better striker? Maybe Amanda Rebas, but when you look at Verna against Murata, you know, she looked quick. She looked really quick on the feet. This one really might just be a close matchup. And uh, if you want to make a pick, you know, it depends what you're picking based on. You know, I think this one's going to be really, really close. You know, Amanda Rebas might slow down after round one and Werner might start getting some takedowns, you know. How do you really make a pick in this one? Who's got the better jujitsu? It's difficult to say. Who's the better striker? Maybe Amanda, but it's not by a lot. I'm going to side with Werner Jandy Doba with the bro who's been using that logic on women's MMA. Didn't use that logic last week on Tabitha Ricci, but yeah, I'll use that logic on this one. Guys, do you ever like listen to the uh, walkout songs for the fighters and ask yourself if this fight was judged based on the walkout song, who would have won? I do it with every fight, literally every fight. Yeah, I'm not going to do that on this one. On this one, I'm going to ask myself, if this one was based on the... Nah, I'm just kidding, man. My pick's going to be Verna. Uh, I think she might take over with the cardio a little bit outside round one. And the actual numbers, we've got Verna plus 110, plus 120. You know, I might tag that a little bit. Amanda Rebas coming back minus 140, minus 150. You know... She might have the better striking, so it does make sense. It's a good matchup, though. Decent matchup. All right, my homies, you know what time it is. It's time for a smoke break. If you waited to smoke with me, amen. If you've been smoking this whole time, double amen. If you're not a smoker, but you enjoy the smoke breaks, that's a triple amen, gang. Let's go. Hey, someone left a comment last week, man. They was like... Every time you say that amen stuff, it makes me wanna... And I'm not gonna say what the person said, but it was something nasty, man. But hey, bro, saying that to me, yeah, is honestly like saying to The Rock, every time you, you tell people what, what it is that you're cooking, every time you say that, it's, 
You know, that's the same thing, bro. The amen thing is my thing, G. Come on, man. Spark up, bro. Come on. But yeah, guys, I hope you're doing well, doing good. Having a good day, having a good week, man. This is my Instagram, at UFC Late. This is my Patreon, at UFC GA. We've done pretty good with our bets last week. A couple letdowns, but still profit. So yeah, massive shout out to all my bros on the Patreon and my uh, Discord group too. Massive shout out to my Discord group, man. He was watching the uh, Starapoli fight and Jamie Pickett fight. And the people in my group were literally... The chat was more entertaining about that fight than actually watching the fight. So yeah, we was uh, a little bit harsh on that one. Not the most entertaining. But yeah, massive shout out to all my bros. So the smoke break question for this week. The smoke break question. Last week it was who was your favourite fighter in 2021. And to be honest, the, the most typed out fighter I think was Chikadze. Uh, I see Garnet typed out a few times and Mano Fierro. But uh, Chikadze I think the most picked. Guys, if I said to you, you can only bet on one Russian fighter. There's only one Russian fighter you're allowed to bet. Who are you betting? You know, you can only pick one Russian. Drop it down in the comment section. Now the smoke break topic on this one, guys. Never give in, never give up, right? No matter what it is that you're doing, no matter what it is that you're focusing on, one step every day, you know, you're going in the right direction. You know, on screen, you can see my YouTube channel. It took me months to even get to like 500 subs. Took me forever. But you know, when you take one step every day, you're going in the right direction. Eventually you've accumulated a thousand steps. It's difficult to accumulate a thousand steps in one step. Not everyone's that talented, right? But if you take a step every day, it's an amen. So yeah guys, that's the smoke break topic. Never give in, never give up. Keep stepping every day. Or as Dory would say on Finding Nemo. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep... You know, just keep swimming, bro. Let's go. Man, that is a stoner movie, to be honest. Now that I think about it, I might watch Finding Nemo. So yeah, guys, let's get into breaking down this sick, sick pay-per-view. Let's go. All right, guys, we've got Magomed and Kalaev taking on... Vulcan Ozdemir. This one's nasty. So Magomed and Kalaev, pretty much nasty anywhere the fight goes. Combat Sambo at the very highest level. When it comes to striking, Magomed and Kalaev at the highest level. Again, the only loss he has in the UFC was against Paul Craig. And to be honest, man, he dominated that whole fight. So as of right now, the only way to beat Magomed and Kalaev You've got to pull out a Hail Mary. Vulcan Ozdemir, you know, against Jiri Prochazka, kind of got folded like a deck chair. You know the deck chairs, they kind of fold in on themselves, right? That's what it looked like when Jiri Prochazka put him out, you know, folded him like a deck chair. Now this deck chair also folds away for storage as well, and I'm going to show you exactly how to do it. And then just lay the deck chair down. Vulcan Ozdemir has folded a few of his opponents you know and that's how he got the no time octagon name you know he came into the ufc and started knocking these guys out and then he'll point to his wrist you know as if to say i did that in no time to be honest guys the only way i see vulcan ozdemir winning he's got to knock him out he's got to knock out magomed ankalaev i know against dominic reyes you know he kind of grappled a little bit but that's not going to be possible against Magomed Ankalaev. You know, you can try. You can try to grapple with this guy, but I don't think it's going to go well. The only way I can see Vulcan Ozdemir winning is a stoppage. But I'm not going to predict that happens, you know. You look at Jiri Prochaska folding him like that. I think it's more likely that Ankalaev folds Vulcan Ozdemir. So that's what I'm going to go with. I'll take Magomed Ankalaev round one, round two. TKO. My numbers on this one, I would put Magomed at least, at least a minus 300. You know, I'm trying to be respectful to Vulcan Ozdemir. 
because he can, you know, he can hurt you. But when your only chance, in my opinion, to win the fight is a TKO, you know, it's, it's a difficult ask, especially against Magomed Ankalaev. And the bookies say minus 350 on Magomed Ankalaev. Yeah, how can you disagree? All right, my homies, we've got Jing Liang Li taking on Hamzat Shemaev. The homie, the Hamzat smash. Guys, if you haven't Hamzat smashed the like button yet, go ahead. All right, so let's start with Hamzat. We know what this guy likes to do, right? It's similar to what Habib does, you know, take you to the mat. But then from there, you know, it's basically take the soul, you know, it's take the soul of the opponent. Now, Jing Liang Li, you know, he kind of sent Santiago Ponzinibbio to the shadow realm. You know, really nasty. So if he can keep it on the feet, if he can strike with Hamzat, he is the better striker, in my opinion. It's nice to see Hamzat put down GM3 with that backhand. You know, it was powerful. But the better striker is still going to be the leech. But man, the big question in this one, can the leech stop the takedown? Can he stop the takedown? Because that's what he has to do if, if he wants to win. If he cannot stop the takedown, we know exactly how this fight is going to end. It's going to be a ground and pound stoppage. But just like I mentioned earlier with Albert Durayev, you know, it can be ground and pound if they give up the sub, we'll take the sub. That's what these smashers are like, man. They'll, they'll hit you. And just kind of check what, what it is you want to go with. Do you want to get subbed? Or are you just going to shell up and I'll finish you with ground and pound? It's one or the other. So maybe the safest bet on Hamzat would be inside the distance. Like I said, if Jing Liang Li can defend the takedown, then it's a completely different story to what I'm speaking about. But my pick, I'm taking the Hamzat smash. TKO submission. Not sure which one it's going to be, but I'm confident that Hamzat does get this fight to the mat. And from there, you know, it's ground and pound city. My numbers, I'm going to put Hamzat, I'd put him at least a minus 400. You know what I'm saying? So it's basically if he can get the takedown, he's minus 400. If he can't, he's not. I'm going to say he does. And the actual numbers, we've got Hamzat minus 400 up to minus 450. So the bookies are saying, yo, you're going to pay for it. If you want to play this line, you're paying, bro. All right, moving into Alexander Volkov taking on Marcin Tybora. Man, good, good matchup. You know, you look at the, the well-rounded game Marcin Tybora has. The grappling's good. The jiu-jitsu on top. He's not the best striker in the world, but nowhere near the worst. You know, he can hold his own when it comes to striking. Alexander Volkov coming off that main event against Garne, you know, kind of got outclassed. You know, Garne too quick, too many kicks to offer. Marcin Tybora is a good kicker, nowhere near as good as Garne. Volkov shouldn't have too much to worry about when it comes to the speed of the kick. Also, Marcin Tybora isn't anywhere near as light on the feet as uh, Garne. You know, in my opinion, guys, this one... It's just, uh, it's a pick em. Marcin Tybora finds a way to win. You know, he'll push you against the fence, take you to the mat. The output's good. Look at the way he was teeing off against Ben Rothwell. Now, Alexander Volkov has better striking defense than Ben Rothwell, but it still goes to show, you know, Marcin Tybora, good fighter. So I wouldn't want to lay a lot of money on Volkov, and I probably won't bet this one at all. But I am going to side with Russia, Again, I'm going to take Alexander Volkov. His boxing is better than Walt Harris. It's better than Greg Hardy. Better than Ben Rothwell. You know, it's a good step up in competition for Marcin Tybora. It is a winnable fight. You know, like I said, he does find a way to win. But Alexander Volkov also finds a way to win. You know, the teeps to the body. Super powerful. You know, just a pick and match up in my opinion. I'm going to side with Volkov. No real confidence though. My numbers, I'd put Volkov maybe six times out of 10. So minus 150. But what do the bookies say? They've got Volkov minus 300. My goodness. Yeah, I wasn't really expecting that type of tax on Volkov. You look at Marcin Tybora on a nice winning streak. 
you know, cashing as a dog a few times too. So yeah, those odds are a little bit shocking in my opinion. But the bookies are like, yo, again, you're going to pay. Good matchup though. Looking forward to that one. All right, my homies, we've got Islam Makashev taking on Dan Hooker. Guys, how much credit does Dan Hooker deserve for taking this matchup? He deserves all the credit in the world, man. Let's spark up for the hangman, Dan Hooker. Now, I've said it a few times on this breakdown, and I'm going to say it again. Islam Makashev is basically doing what Habib does. You know, take down the opponent. From there, we're going to take the soul. That's what Islam Makashev does. You know, he done it to Drew Dober. He done it to Tiago Moises. He outgrappled Arman Sarukian, who's a high-level prospect. So, you know, guys, if we're going to ask ourselves the question, can Islam Makashev take down Dan Hooker? I think the answer has to be yes. Now, the hangman, like I said, man, all the credit in the world for taking this match up. I'm going to be completely honest. I think Dan Hooker can win this one, but it only happens one way. I would really be shocked if it happened any other way. I think if Dan Hooker's going to win, it's going to be raising the knee into the temple, into the jaw of Islam Makashev. You know, because if Dan Hooker tries to throw a kick the way he was kicking Nasrat, Islam's going to catch that and take him down. If Dan Hooker tries to sit down on the punches, Islam Makashev's going to level change right into the legs. If Dan Hooker stays on the outside and gets pushed against the fence... You know, Islam's going to work takedowns from there. The only way in my head I can see Dan Hooker winning this fight is simply catching Islam on the way in. And the specific tool that he's going to catch Islam with, like I said, it's going to be the knee. If Dan Hooker can prove me wrong and win this one, you know, by submission or decision or get a TKO with the hands, you know, I'm going to be amazed. I'm going to be going crazy. But what I see mostly in this one, guys, is Islam Makashev, Habib 2.0, with the takedown, with the ground and pound. Can he finish Dan Hooker on the mat? You know, if you can finish a black belt like Thiago Moises, you can finish Dan Hooker on the mat. But there is no way that Dan Hooker is going to give up that finish easily, right? You know, he's not just going to say to Islam, yo, go ahead, ground and pound me. Yo, go ahead, choke me out. If anyone's going to make it difficult to get a finish, it's going to be Dan Hooker. So I'm going to take Islam, but I'm going to take a decision over a stoppage. Like if either guy gets a stoppage here, you know, it's a massive statement. Yeah, my numbers on this one, guys, I'm going to be harsh. The only way Dan Hooker can win, in my opinion, is a knee. So I'm going to put Islam minus 400. And we've got Islam Makashev minus... 600 minus 700 a spark up for Dan Hooker man that's a disrespect you know even my line is it's disrespectful really but minus seven come on man but yeah good fight massive respect to Dan Hooker I'm looking forward to it man it's gonna be fireworks whatever happens it's gonna be a good fight you know, you just get done sparking up for Dan Hooker, but you've got to spark up again because now you've got a sick title fight between Peter Yan or Peter Yan taking on Corey Sandhagen, the Sandman. You know, Peter Yan is arguably the best Muay Thai fighter at bantamweight. Man, scrap, scrap the Muay Thai. He's maybe the best bantamweight fighter in the UFC. And he has a chance to prove that here against Corey Sandhagen. Now, he was proving that against Aljamain Sterling. You know, but Peter Yan, you know, he, he's a no mercy type of guy. You know, he's not going to show mercy. So he landed that illegal knee and it was like, you know. If he dies, if he dies. Man, the way Peter Yan raised his hand after that fight too. Like, oh my God. It really is no mercy, huh? But Peter Yan, man, you know, the grappling's good. The Muay Thai is good. How many Muay Thai fighters can you say the boxing is better than the elbows, better than the kicks? You know, with Peter Yan, the boxing is so evident. If I'm thinking of ways that Corey Sandhagen is going to beat Peter Yan, you know, it's, it's kind of a little bit like Dan Hooker, to be honest. The only way I see Corey Sandhagen winning is 
doing something that he's done before, like spinning and catching the opponent. Or what he done to Frankie Edgar, you know, bring the opponent into that dead space and hit him with a knee. Because if he doesn't do that, arguably what you've got then is a, a Peter Yan fight. You know, is Corey Sandhagen going to pick apart Peter Yan from a distance? Maybe for five minutes, maybe for seven minutes. But this is a 25 minute fight. We just witnessed Corey Sandhagen go 25 minutes against TJ Dillashaw. And to be honest, man, the, the low kicks of TJ Dillashaw, they slowed down Corey Sandhagen. You know, he's a big guy at bantamweight, nearly six foot tall. And those legs, they're not as durable as you would like. And Peter Yan's going to kick him. He's going to kick those legs. You know, if TJ Dillashaw can slow you down with that low kick, there's no doubt in my mind Peter Yang can do it too. If I'm Corey Sandhagen, I'm just drilling constant spinning attacks. I'm just drilling knees. I'm trying to create craziness. If that craziness doesn't happen, I think Peter Yang just, you know, round by round, slowly dismantles Corey Sandhagen. Corey Sandhagen is really tough. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say it goes to 25 minutes. Ultimately, guys, I believe Corey Sandhagen isn't going to be durable enough. So outside of that crazy KO that we know he is capable of, you know, he can do it. But outside of that, I think Peter Yan's going to round by round dismantle. So I'm going to take no mercy. If he dies, he dies. Peter Yan. My numbers on this one may be a little bit harsh again, but man, I'm high on Peter Yan. I'd go at least a, at least a minus 350. And the actual numbers, Peter Yan minus 250 with the bookies. So I'm higher on Peter Yan than the bookie. You know, Corey Sandhagen returning plus 200. Man, he, he can. He can win. Corey Sandhagen can absolutely win, but he's got to enter the matrix. You know, against one of the toughest 35ers on the planet. It's going to be difficult. I'm taking the Russian. All right, my homies. Main event, we've got Jan Blakovic taking on Glover Teixeira. If you've enjoyed this breakdown, make sure you Hamzat smash the like button. If you're not subscribed, you know, go ahead and do that too. Amen. Yeah, got very stoned on this breakdown, man. But rightfully so, you know, fire card, fire pay-per-view. All right, so Jan Blakovic taking on Glover Teixeira. Jan Blakovic is known as Polish power, rightfully so. You look at what he done to Dominic Reyes. Total obliteration. It means total obliteration. You know, he broke Luke Rockhold's jaw, you know, sent his jaw into the, into the crowd, really. What he done against Israel Adesanya was extremely frustrating but at the same time, extremely intelligent. It shows me that Jan Blakovich wants to stay champion. He's not only getting in there and, and breaking jaws, he's getting in there and, and fighting the fight he needs to fight. Now, I'll be honest, guys, when I saw Glover Teixeira get absolutely obliterated by Rumble Johnson, and when I saw those five uppercuts in a row by Alexander Gustafsson in the fifth round, against Glover in Sweden. When I saw these two moments, man, it was like, this is it for Glover. This is it. It's done. But no, it's not. It's not. You know, Glover Teixeira, the man just, he finds a way to win. He's a veteran. So who am I to say that he can't beat Jan Blakovic? You know, I thought his career was done after those two fights. But here we are. He's got a title fight. If Glover Teixeira wins this fight, it's not going to be the most shocking thing I've ever seen. But I'm not going to make that prediction. I have to stick with Polish power. You know, I, I respect both of these guys, man. You know, you look at the, the climb from Jan Blakovic. You know, a guy who never gave up, you know, even when it looked like, you know, he would never be champion, taking losses years ago. But then he's stringing them together. You know, even Thiago Santos beat him a few years ago. And even after that, straight away, back on back on the winning streak, putting wins together. So Jan Blakovic, man, how can you count this guy out? How can you count out Glover Teixeira at this point too? Man, what you've got here is two guys who are just proving people wrong. Year in, year out, proving people wrong. Guys, my prediction on this one, I'm going to say and still. 
Polish power. Round one, round two, TKO. If I'm wrong and Glover Teixeira becomes the new 205 champion, my goodness. My numbers, I'm going to put Jan Blakovic minus 300. And the actual numbers from the bookies, minus 275 up to minus 300 on Jan Blakovic. So again, man, they're giving you those plus odds on Glover Teixeira. Counting him out. Is he going to do it again? Man, how crazy would it be? How crazy would it be? All right, my homies, make sure you drop down your underdogs, parlays, all of that good stuff in the comment section. And my homies, you know what it is, man. Keep your eyes to the sky and never glue to your shoes. Mac Miller. All right, peace.